Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father, through our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's Word I want to consider with you this morning is the second half of our second reading from God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Dear friends, with rare exception, they had no rights. They could be arrested, imprisoned, and held indefinitely without bail. They could be beaten and abused. They could have their property seized with no recourse. They could be exiled and sent off to the mines to work in dehumanizing and very dangerous conditions. They could be summarily executed. They had no protection under the law, no habeas corpus, no due process. The reason? They were Christians. And it was an officially government-sanctioned mass persecution handed down from the emperor himself, Nero. And maybe that puts something like a stay-at-home order in perspective. The year was about 64 A.D. And that is what the Christians living in the Roman provinces that made up what we know today as the modern-day nation of Turkey. Needless to say, those believers in Jesus were suffering, and suffering terribly. And so Jesus' apostle Peter wrote a letter to them, the letter that we call 1 Peter. And chances are, he wrote this letter to them from the capital city of Rome. His goal was to give these suffering Christians comfort and encouragement from God, to remind them and to remind all Christians, even Christians who would live centuries after them, that we have victory over all of it, no matter what. When Christians face suffering, there are two particular dangers that also come along with that suffering, and those dangers are addressed here by the Apostle Peter. And the first danger is actually the danger of pride. I'm going to back up one verse in 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to back up starting with verse 5. Here's what Peter writes to them. He said, All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And that is a quote of Proverbs chapter 3. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. The word for proud here in the original language literally means to make yourself super visible. To say, hey, look at me, look at how great I am. Now let's say that you are recognized for for this achievement or, 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 or for that accomplishment. In that moment, do, do we like to automatically give all the glory to God? who has given us the ability to do what we can do on a daily basis? Or do we like to keep some of that glory for ourselves and kind of relish in it, kind of like an athlete who points at the nameplate on the back of his jersey after making a great play? Look at me. Look at how great I am. Yes, this feels so good because I'm so awesome. Do I go out of my way to help somebody simply for the sake of helping that person? Or deep down inside is is part of my motivation also the hope that I'm going to get some kind of recognition for it, for, for other people to see just how good of a person I am. Or maybe, just maybe, 
I'm trying to convince myself that I'm a good person and to inflate my own sense of self in my own mind. And yes, true confession here. Even when a pastor hears something like, Pastor, that was a great sermon. Despite his feeble attempts to resist, his sinful, selfish pride wells up within him. Yes, this is a danger even for suffering Christians to be prideful because they can be tempted to think, oh God, look at us, look at how much we are suffering and it's all for you. Look at what good believers, what good Christians we are. Aren't you just so pleased with us? We must be a cut above other people. Or maybe the temptation of pride that comes along with suffering comes in the form of thinking that, God, I think I know better than you, and I don't think it's very good. I don't think it's right that we should be suffering so. I think I know more. I think I know better. Making myself super visible. God opposes, literally stands against the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. And that is why Peter wrote to these Christians, humble yourselves under God's mighty, under the mighty hand of God. Because ultimately, brothers and sisters, all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. You know, it's said that the reformer Martin Luther on his deathbed, his final words were these. We are beggars. This is true. And that's right, isn't it? We are but beggars. Having nothing of value to claim of our own instead having to rely on what is given to us to have something valuable. And who gives something to us? Mighty God. And what is it that he gives? Grace. Grace in our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace in Jesus, crucified and risen. Grace in those nail-pierced hands and the blood that flowed from it to cleanse all of our sin. Yes, in God's grace, we have victory over our selfish pride. Another danger that I face, especially in times of suffering, is worry and anxiety. Yes, as sinful Christians living in a sinful world, there is no shortage, is there, of things to worry about, things to be anxious about. I'm sure if given the chance, each and every one of us could make a list that is pretty close to a mile long of all the things that we have in this world and in this life facing us to, to be afraid of, to be worried about and anxious about. But in those anxieties and fears, there lies danger. You know, my grandma Ertl used to tell me, she said, Jordan, worrying give, may give you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And to add to that, not only does worrying and being anxious about things not get us anywhere, they're even dangerous. It's interesting because the, the word in the original language here used for anxiety is the same word that Jesus used in his parable of the four soils. Do you remember that parable? Jesus talked about a man going out to sow seed on, on, and that seed landed on four different kinds of ground. And one of the, one of the types of ground that that's, that seed landed on was thorny soil. And that seed, it did sprout and it did grow up, but what happened? The thorns grew up and, and choked that plant out. And in explaining that parable, Jesus said how that, that, 
that seed is the word of God and, and the soil is people and the, sprant, and the plant that sprouts is faith. And those thorns are anxieties and cares of this world. Or do you remember the story of Jesus visiting Mary and Martha? You remember what happened? Mary was, was sitting there listening to Jesus as, as he spoke. And what's Martha doing? Well, she's being the busybody running all the over creation, taking care of this and taking care of that and, and doing this cooking and, and, and this cleaning. And she gets so fed up because Mary's leaving all the work for her that she kind of tattles to Jesus on Mary. And she says, Lord, tell her to help me. And what did Jesus say? Martha, you are worried about many things. Same word used in 1 Peter chapter 5 here. The point? Our fears and anxieties are dangerous. Because if we fixate on them too much, they can choke out our faith and those fears and anxieties can also be a distraction from us, distracting us away from our Jesus. And so, what does God want us to do with all of our anxiety? To cast them on him. Literally, to throw them on God. And if you take something and you throw it on God, it's not yours anymore, is it? So take all of your fears, your worries, and anxieties and take them to the Lord in prayer. Throw them on Him and leave them there knowing that your God is going to take care of them. How do we know that? Because He cares for you. We may be worked up and anxious about all sorts of things in this world and in this life, we may have all sorts of worries, but God's one care is what? It's you. And in that, you have victory. So yes, even in suffering, Christians face dangers, don't they? Dangers to pride, dangers to to anxiety and fear. And letting those things go unchecked is exactly what the devil wants because then he comes along. And what did Peter call him in these verses? He is a roaring lion on the prowl, looking, eagerly anticipating, on the hunt, just wanting and waiting for a soul to devour to gobble up and swallow and utterly destroy. That is what he wants to do with you, and that's what he wants to do with me, brothers and sisters. And the more we are focused in on ourselves, whether in pride or focused in on ourselves, in our, all of our fears and anxieties and worries, the easier the prey we become for him. Yes, it's a cliche saying, but we do have to give the devil his due. He is an eternal threat to us. And so, resist him. And now may that, that may sound easier said than done, after all considering the tremendous threat he is, but there's a little wordplay here in the original language. Literally translated, Peter writes, stand against him. How? By standing in the faith. When you stand in the faith, you are standing against the devil. And standing in the faith does not mean that we just have to, to work it up in ourselves to believe and trust well enough and hard enough, and I really got to work hard at it, because then I'll finally be able to resist the devil. No. Standing in the faith means standing firmly on the content of God's truth. Standing firm in the object of your trust. It's not you believing, it's what you believe in. Stand firm upon the truth 
of God's word. Yes, stand firm in the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was delivered over to death for all of your sins and he was raised to life for your justification. Stand firm in the fact that Jesus was crucified for all of your sins and he rose again to give you eternal life and in that he has crushed the head of the devil and the devil no longer has any power over you. Why? Because through faith you belong to Jesus. Stand firm in the truth of what Jesus said in John 17 when he is praying to the Father. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Stand firm in the faith, in the object of your faith, in your Savior Jesus, because in him you have victory over sin. In him you have victory over the devil. In him you have victory over death. In Jesus you have victory over worry and fear and anxiety. In Jesus you have victory over pride. In Jesus you have victory over suffering. In Jesus you have victory over all of it. Forever. Amen. And may the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, he will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And we join to confess our Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed.